name is Laura Gellner and I am a yoga therapist and occupational therapist based in New Jersey. I created the Yoga Focus podcast as a way to talk about the tools and techniques of yoga and to see how we can use those techniques to create a greater sense of focus and clarity within our life. Hi everyone, welcome to the Yoga Focus podcast. Today I'm going to be talking about some of the things that I think it's important for newer yoga teachers to know. When you go through teacher training, you learn a huge amount of information in a short period of time. And it's a lot of new skills, especially if you haven't been a teacher of something else before. Stepping into that role of being in charge and instructing people and guiding them in what they're doing is a really big step for some people and I think the the overwhelming idea out there is being a yoga teacher is so easy and in certain ways being a yoga teacher is just a fantastic experience obviously I've been doing it for a long time I love it but it's definitely not easy and you can refer to one of my recent videos about the components of what it takes to be a really great yoga teacher. Not just okay, not just somebody who can throw poses together, but a very skilled, competent yoga teacher pulls in a ton of knowledge and a ton of skills. So as a brand new yoga teacher, that can feel super overwhelming. So this is the information that I think you need to know in order to start moving into that role and building some confidence. The very first thing right after you come out of teacher training is some teachers jump right into teaching and they're fine and other teachers kind of step back and they're like, no, I don't, I don't feel like I know enough. And because the scope of practice is so huge, you can definitely get stuck in that feeling of I don't know enough yet to step into that role of teacher. Yoga Alliance has decided that the 200 hours of training and that mixture of philosophy and practical skills and history is a, a jumping off point. It's a starting point. You're not going to feel like you know everything and that you are super competent as a teacher. You're a new teacher. So just understand that. And I think starting to teach in some capacity after you finish your original teacher training is very important because learning from a book is different from actually doing it. You can sit around with your other teachers in training and talk about things and even practice teaching them, but it's so totally different when you get into a room of students and see how those skills actually play out in that capacity. So my advice here is to start teaching in whatever opportunities that you have. It might not necessarily be a studio right off the bat, but if you have friends that want to come over and you can teach them a yoga class or family members. I know all of my friends and family have been through sessions like that where I worked through poses with them and practiced things and just kind of worked on how things interacted with their body and that was a great learning experience. Which leads me into the next one, which is videotape yourself and then go through the process of giving yourself feedback. You can also seek feedback from other people, other teachers, especially more experienced teachers, because they'll have an important perspective on how your skills are shining through, how you're putting together a class. But because nowadays access to video is really quite easy with your phone or there's a lot of different cameras out there videotaping yourself and then going back and watching it can be a really uncomfortable experience if you've never done it it can feel really weird the first time you do that and the first time you listen to yourself talking through a class but there's so much that can be learned because sometimes we get to the end of teaching and you kind of forget like wait what did i do what happened the video is going to let you sit down when you can completely concentrate and think about, well, how was my languaging? How did I interact with the students? How did I sequence that class? Was it a smart sequence or was I just throwing any pose out there that I could think of? There's a big difference between 
planning ahead and creating a sequence that has a goal instead of just randomly throwing out poses that kind of go well together. But uh, that's a topic for another day when we talk about sequencing skills. So start teaching, find the opportunities that are open to you and take them. It's also going to help you to learn what settings you like or what populations you like working with. Maybe kids yoga is not for you. Maybe you like working with athletes a lot. So in the beginning, grabbing those opportunities just to practice is going to help you to figure that out. And then going through that process of self-feedback and videotaping yourself. That's actually how I got started on YouTube, interestingly enough. When I was a newer teacher, I got a little digital camera and I thought, let me videotape my class that I was teaching at that time. And then I would go back and watch it. And then some of my students who had uh, missed certain classes asked to have access to those videos. So I started posting them online. And uh, when I go back and watch those, they're really... <laughs> The, the evolution of how I've changed as a teacher and um, how much better quality our recording devices are now from almost 15 years ago. It's, it's really amazing. Okay, so number three, don't rush into a specialty. You do your 200 hour training, you come out as a general yoga teacher. You don't really have a specialty and that's okay because I think your first at least like six months to a year of being a yoga teacher is building comfort in that role of I'm the person at the front of the room, I'm in charge of watching over everybody, giving guidance, watching how they respond to the things that I am saying and correcting or giving other feedback based on what I see the students doing. That is a skill that can take years to master. But if we start adding specialty on top of that, it can get really complicated. So the first few months to the first year of being a teacher, just get really good at being in the role of teacher and integrating everything that you learned in the 200 hour teacher training so that you are really owning that information before you go and pile more information on top of it. Because I see some people getting stuck in the loop of constantly needing more education before they feel comfortable, but it's more about getting some education and integrating it, getting a little bit more education and integrating it. That's really important that you give yourself the spaces to apply and see how it plays out in the real world. The next one is studying different styles and trying different teaching formats. Variety. So you're a new teacher, maybe you don't quite know, do I want to teach group classes at a yoga studio or a gym or maybe corporate yoga or one-on-one -on -one private sessions or yoga for athletes? What, what type of yoga is going to work the best for you? Yoga for children, yoga for arthritis. There's so many different options and you can really try some of those different options. There's also things now like teaching online, where we always thought of yoga as something that had to happen in person, but we have so many resources now that you could just teach yoga online to people and never have to step foot in a studio if you don't like that particular environment. The other thing on here is studying different styles. So maybe you were trained in Iyengar. My teacher was mostly Iyengar trained, but pulled in some other types of yoga. And hopefully your teacher training exposes you to other types of yoga, not just one, because there's strengths that can be taken from all the different types of yoga. I tend to not encourage people to pick just one form and only study that, like you only practice Iyengar because there's always going to be things that are missing that other forms of practice can really help to fill in those gaps and create a more holistic practice. So don't be afraid to go take classes with teachers who are trained in a different style than you. It's a great way to learn just different ways of explaining poses, different breath work, see how they run the class and how they interact with the students, see what you like and what you don't like, because you as a teacher can then take the things that you feel like were effective and bring that into your teaching. So very powerful learning tool for new teachers, studying other teacher styles, other forms of yoga. Okay, number five, 
find an experienced mentor. The reason for this is because when you finish your 200 hour training, you've had a lot of support all through those 200 hours, a lot of interaction, a lot of other people to bounce ideas off of and get feedback from. And then what I find with new teachers is they graduate and they're so excited to start teaching. And as they do start teaching, a lot of questions come up, a lot of uncertainty comes up. Should I do this or should I do that? Did I do that correctly? I'm not sure how to handle this situation. What should I do? And depending on your location or if you have a lot of friends who are also yoga teachers, maybe more experienced yoga teachers, you might be able to bounce some ideas off of them. But really for most teachers, it can be so helpful to have a mentor to talk about that stuff with, to bring your problems and your questions to, to bring up things that you are uncertain about or not quite as confident about. And a good mentor will help to guide you through that process of really finding your own voice as a yoga teacher, figuring out how you teach your classes authentically. They can also help you to bridge that gap between the classroom information and actually applying it. And that's where I encourage you to find a teacher who is quite experienced. I would say at least eight to 10 years as a teacher, maybe beyond 10 years, because they've seen a lot of different things. They've probably taught in a large variety of settings. So they're going to be able to guide you in multiple areas. And I, I think of having a mentor as a yoga teacher as like catapulting you into the future and really speeding up that learning process. It's also kind of like the equivalent of having a personal trainer. If you are somebody who wants to go to the gym and wants to get in shape, but you're kind of like, oh, I'm not going to go today, I'll go tomorrow. If you have an appointment with a personal trainer, you're going to go. So having scheduled meetings with a mentor and that mentor may be giving you some homework to work on in between and then asking you about that, it holds you accountable. So it makes you have to stay focused in that progress as a teacher. So having a mentor can just fast forward your progress as a yoga teacher. Number six is walk in with a plan. What I find with teachers who walk into the room and just kind of see what happens and I'm just going to organically create a class, more often than not, they will tend to do very similar things all the time. And these are usually the teachers who come to me and say, I kind of feel like I'm in a rut. I'm always teaching the same poses. I'm always explaining things the same way because that's what automatically comes out of their mind. So my response to that is plan your class ahead. You don't have to stick to the plan. Um, I have always written out my plan before I teach. And sometimes I'll teach like 50% of what I had planned. Sometimes I'll teach 10% of it. Sometimes I'll throw it out the window when I see who's actually in my class. So walk in with a plan that's going to guide the way that you teach, but stay flexible because you're teaching the people who are in front of you. So if you get to the point where you're like, oh, I had hip opening planned and then somebody is coming back after hip surgery, maybe I'm not going to do some of those really deep hip poses because it's not appropriate for that person. So I'm going to swing it in this other direction. That kind of flexibility takes a lot of practice and it takes a lot of practice with writing out lesson plans. So one of the projects that I'm working on right now are little online courses that give out sequencing and planning exercises and show you guys how I theme classes because I am a, a big advocate of creating some kind of cohesive idea to the practice, not just saying, okay, we're going to move around and do postures and you're going to feel good at the end. Being a teacher to me is about making sure that the students walk out of the room with some sort of knowledge or some sort of understanding about themselves or their body that they didn't have when they first came in, right? That's what we think of as a teacher, somebody who is conveying knowledge and information. And I think yoga kind of got off the rails as a yoga teacher being somebody who can string together poses and have you ohm at the end and you're done. 
and it was a nice experience, but you really haven't learned anything. So I want to see the pendulum swing back toward the teaching end. I want yoga teachers to really be able to convey information in small digestible bites and creating a plan ahead of time is a way to do that. So planning is also a way to kind of train your brain to think about what needs to be in a yoga class so that it's well-rounded, so that it's effective, so that your students leave feeling really good, that you didn't do like 37 different shoulder stretches that overworked one part of the body and neglected the hips, or you did too much forward bending in the spine and not enough twisting and back bending, so you feel really kind of out of whack when you're leaving. Creating a plan, again, is a way to put it down on paper and say, is this balanced? Do I need to add or take away something? How can I make this practice more effective? How can I use smarter sequencing? So a lot of times that has to happen before you teach, not during. All right, next one is don't overwork to make sure that you do not burn out. I know a lot of teachers who reach that point of burnout, and part of this is because it's hard to make a living as a yoga teacher. If you're trying to make your full income as a yoga teacher, I know of teachers who would teach like 15 or so classes a week, and you are running around like a maniac when you're teaching that much. And that leads to teaching the same thing over and over, losing that spark and that passion, and getting to that point of burnout where you just don't enjoy the process anymore and your teaching becomes very lackluster because of that burnout. And what will happen at that point is people will get out of teaching yoga and I see that as such a sad thing because these were people who were really good teachers and had so much to share but because they overburdened themselves with teaching, they end up leaving because they just don't feel the passion anymore. So be really mindful of how much teaching is sustainable for you and how much education and self-practice and self-care you need to use to balance out that role of being a teacher so that you can continue to teach for many, many years. Because what we really need in the yoga community are teachers with 15, 20, 25, 30 years of experience to convey to their students, not the people who have been teaching for two years and they want to share their information. That's fine. We all start somewhere. But we need teachers to stay in that role of being a yoga teacher for the duration because that's where we get even more value. They have incredible wisdom to pass down to the next generation of teachers. So. We need to make sure that you don't burn out so you can become one of those teachers who are incredibly skilled and experienced. Next one is keep up your home practice. Your home practice feeds your teaching. My best classes come out of me right after I have practiced. So if I get to the studio early if possible and I move around on the mat, even if it's just like 10 or 15 minutes, to set myself into that role and clear the mental space so that I am able to channel that information more effectively and be really present and interactive with my students. That is the best case scenario. So that practice before you teach or just in general making sure you maintain a regular practice. It doesn't have to be every single day. Every day would be great but a lot of times our schedules don't allow that. I always say that I do some yoga every day. I don't necessarily do a formal practice where I would roll out my mat and be on it for an hour, but every single day I do some piece of a yoga practice. Sometimes it's two hours because it's Saturday and I just feel like I really need it, and sometimes it's two minutes of me stretching and moving and breathing because that's what I can fit in that day. But make sure that your personal practice stays a really solid part of your daily schedule. And if you feel yourself getting burnt out, think back and say, have I been practicing? Have I been practicing enough to really feed my teaching and to keep me in a good space to be an effective teacher? I love getting on my mat, putting a notebook right next to it and just thinking like, okay, what do I want to teach this week? And I start moving around and thinking 
and then I'll come up with a sequence and I'm like, oh, I like that. I'll write it down. And then I'll say, okay, well, what can I do after that? And then I'll move around a little bit more and I'll think. And that's the process that we use to create yoga classes that have a lot of thought behind them. And it goes back to that planning idea. That's the process that I go through with planning. And I think that's the process that's really helpful to a lot of people. You can pull out books and resources and look at them and then feel it in your body and see what part of that you would like to convey to your students. Okay, so keep up your home practice. Next one is find your style. When you come out of teacher training, you had probably one main teacher who conveyed the information to you in the style that they teach, which is fine. You're not going to keep every single aspect of that because you're a different teacher. Some teachers like to chant, some teachers don't. Some teachers put a really heavy emphasis on breath work and meditation. Some teachers put more of an emphasis on asana practice. Sometimes teachers like to read poems or some sort of passage during class. Other teachers like to use funky music to really set the tone. There's so many different ways that you can teach your form of yoga. And the important thing is that you have to feel comfortable with it. If chanting is something that you really love and you want to share with your students, that's great. But if chanting kind of weirds you out and you're not really sure if it fits your style, that's okay, you don't have to chant. And there's some students who will like the fact that you don't chant. So finding your style and then finding the students who are going to really wanna practice with you because of your authentic style takes some evolution and some time, but just understand that that whole process is very natural. All right, find your style and then um, know what you don't know and be ready to refer out. This is especially important when you're a new teacher. You can always go back to your mentor and ask them about different situations. I just got a message the other day about a teacher who had a student who was having a lot of wrist pain and downward facing dog and they weren't sure how to handle it. So um, I sent a few different options of how to modify, how to offer different poses, maybe how to adjust the hand position in downward facing dog to see if any of those things make an impact. But at a certain point, you also have to say, I don't know. And I think you should talk to your doctor about that. Or I think you should see a physical therapist or an occupational therapist to see what's going on with that wrist or whatever it might be. Don't give medical advice. Medical advice is outside the scope of our practice. And as a yoga teacher, you're going to get all sorts of crazy questions about people wanting you to fix this or fix that. And it's not your job. Your job is to teach people yoga and to help them modify their yoga practice so it feels good in their body, but your job is not to fix them. So in that situation, you have to say, that's a medical thing. I don't have training in that. Go talk to your doctor. Go talk to your physical therapist. Find a medical professional. It's also good to build relationships with people in the area so that you'll have cards and you'll be like, oh, this is the physical therapist that I think is great. Go see them. They'll take good care of you. That is a really good way to build confidence in your students as well, that you're not going to tell them some made up information just to make it sound like you know what you're talking about. You're going to give them an accurate answer and important, useful information. That's so important. All right, next one, don't just teach postures. I know there are some yoga trainings out there that are super focused on just teaching postures and there are trainings where you can get certified in like a two or three day weekend because they teach you the names of the poses and they teach you how to sequence one after the other and boom, you're a yoga teacher. You are <laughs> more like a trainer or somebody like a, a group class instructor who knows yoga poses. You're not really a yoga teacher until you know the full eight limbs of yoga and you try to encompass that in your teaching. We don't have to teach every single limb in every single class all the time, but the power and probably the thing that drew you to yoga was not just the postures. 
it was the breathing and it was the meditation techniques and it was the philosophy and all those things that come together create that really, really powerful system. If it was just about the exercise and just about the movements, then we would all be doing gymnastics, but we're not. So understand that the power of yoga comes from its holistic nature and try to pull that into your teaching. Let the students know what all of the limbs are, not just the postures. All right, so last one, yep, number 12. Don't get stuck or caught up in what I call the yoga controversies. There are a lot of topics in yoga that you are going to see two completely different opinions on, and I mean a lot of topics. So what I see often happening with new yoga teachers is they get so confused and frustrated because this person is saying to do this and that person is saying to do that. They don't know which is right and why are they so opposite and they just kind of throw their hands up and they're like, I don't, I don't know what to do. So my advice is you have to know the why. You have to know the context. And the context and what you are trying to accomplish is going to help you to figure out which one you were supposed to be utilizing. And I'll give you an example. One of my students that I was talking to the other day, one of my mentees, was asking about when we do rotations, are you just rotating the thoracic spine or do we bring the pelvis along into the rotation? And the controversy behind this comes from the sacroiliac joint that some people, if they twist too aggressively, can start to develop pain in the SI joint. So the idea was proposed that we should never just twist from the spine, that we should always twist spine and pelvis together to protect the SI joint. Now, there's a lot that could go into this. I could do an entire episode just talking about the SI joint and how we prepare the body for movement and how important loading is and all sorts of other things. But what you want to know is, does that student have a history of SI joint pain? Um, are they close to giving childbirth? Because that's something that's going to affect the ligaments around the pelvis. Um, how strong is that student overall? Are you teaching a class of like college athletes or are you teaching a class at a senior center where you're using a chair a lot for support and maybe their pelvic girdles are not as strong and stable as they could be? So there's a lot of factors that are going into that. To say that we should always twist with the pelvis stationary or that we should always twist with the, pe the pelvis being mobile is really an oversimplification. Always come back to the why and the context that you are working on and be able to work out the details, the information underneath. And a lot of that comes from our understanding of anatomy. So important to have that strong foundation in anatomy. And unfortunately, that's one of the areas that I hear from new students that they feel shaky on, which is also why I tend to focus on teaching anatomy to new yoga teachers to get that really solid, confident understanding of the body. So don't get caught up in those yoga controversies. Just try to understand the context that you are working in and what is applicable in that context. And that kind of ties into the bonus one over here. I'm going to move my leg. Um, use good, high quality education sources and be very careful of social media. Social media is where I see a lot of those yoga controversies being kicked up and you get these little tiny snippets of information and very often those snippets of information are conveyed in a way that stirs the pot. Be very careful of people who put out little pieces of information to stir up controversy and get attention because those are the accounts that if you are looking at them every day it's going to really make you question your ability as a yoga teacher. Well, I don't know, should I do it this way? This person says that and it will start a whole internal conflict with you. I'm not saying that you should avoid differing opinions. Differing opinions presented in a rational and educational way is great. And there's a lot of that on social media too. 
I'll give you some great accounts that you can follow, some people that I've learned a ton of information from, but just understand that you need to be really good at unfollowing people who post things that are unhelpful or just about gaining attention. Be really careful of that. All right, so those are my 12 really 13 pieces of advice that I like to give new yoga teachers. If you're a yoga teacher and maybe you came out of teacher training recently, what advice did you find to be helpful? What kind of information helped you to make that leap into your role as a yoga teacher? Or if you're an experienced yoga teacher, let me know what you tell new teachers to help them with that transition. Thank you so much for being here on the Yoga Focus podcast. I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining me in this episode of the Yoga Focus podcast. If you'd like to leave me a comment or a question, you can go over to my YouTube channel at Laura G Yoga and leave a comment under the video format of the podcast. Or you can go on to my Instagram, which is also at Laura G Yoga and leave me a question or send me a direct message on there. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end of the podcast. I just wanted to talk to you guys about the book that I released in June of 2019, which is called Yoga Therapy at the Wall. I have worked on this book for the past three years to create all of the pictures and all of the information in here. It's 162 pages and it's a full color manual. The chapters are broken down by body parts that we focus on using the wall to help us learn about different movement patterns and how to change some of the yoga postures to have a specific therapeutic focus. And you can really start to understand when you look at the book why I feel like the wall is the most underutilized prop that we have in yoga. We kind of forget about these things that we have all around us and that we almost always have access to a wall to utilize in the practice. So. This manual will give you a ton of ideas to expand and start to utilize the wall as a prop. If you're interested in ordering, you can get the printed version on lulu.com. Um, you can either take the link in the show notes or you can go on Lulu and look up yoga therapy at the wall. There's also a digital download option, but for that you have to go on Etsy and my Etsy store is Healthy Focus by Laura G. Or you can just search yoga therapy at the wall. Thanks. Hope you enjoy it.